The prophetic mantle demonstrating the functionality of LDS prophet. The LDS Church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, claims to be the restored gospel on earth. It claims to have the saving ordinances required for one to go back to live with their Father in heaven and with their family forever. The LDS Church teaches its members that at the top of the church is Jesus Christ who leads his top leaders in the church, who are considered prophets, seers, and revelators, because they're supposed to have the gifts to be able to prophesy, see, and give revelation. Latter-day Saints all across the world are taught to revere these men as being just like Moses, Noah, and Abraham, and the other Old Testament prophets. So today we're going to take a look at the claims of the LDS Church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and take a look at the prophetic mantle and see if there is evidence that these top men in the church are in fact just like Moses, Noah, and Abraham, and are in fact prophets, seers, and revelators. And we're going to do so also noting some of the psychology that goes into belief. One such psychological phenomena is called the illusory truth effect. The illusory truth effect is the tendency to believe information to be correct after repeated exposure. The illusory truth effect has played a significant role in fields like campaigns, advertising, news media, propaganda throughout world history. The idea is that if you hear something enough, if you hear it over and over again, then eventually your brain compels you to believe in the thing that you're being told. Latter-day Saints all over the world learn from an early age about prophets, seers, and revelators. It starts all the way in primary, where the young children are taught to follow the prophet. Every Sunday, as Latter-day Saints all around the world go to church, they are in classrooms sitting with Sunday school lessons and primary lessons, young men and young women lessons. You've got the little kids in primary. You've got the teenagers in their classes. You've got the adults in their Sunday school, in their priesthood and relief society classes. And the church produces its own curriculum, which instructs the members that the top leaders of the church are in fact prophets, seers, and revelators, just like Moses, Noah, and Abraham. Latter-day Saints are encouraged to stand up once a month at fast and testimony meeting to share their testimony, even in cases where they don't really have one. Here is LDS leader Dallin H. Oaks, a member of the First Presidency in the present moment, but then a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, instructing members of the church to go ahead, even if they don't have a testimony, to go ahead and bear it anyway, and that by doing so, they would actually gain a testimony. Another way to seek a testimony seems astonishing when compared with the methods of obtaining other knowledge. We gain or strengthen a testimony by bearing it. Someone even suggested that some testimonies are better gained on the feet bearing them than on the knees praying for them. This actually isn't astonishing at all once you recognize that this is exactly how the illusory truth effect works. So Latter-day Saints all over the world every month stand up and bear their testimony that not only do they know that their church is the one true church on the earth, but that whoever the current leader is at the top and those who surround him in the top 15 of leadership are called as prophets, seers, and revelators. Latter-day Saints from a young age are taught to revere their leaders. Even in artwork which compares the prophets of the modern day to the prophets of the Old Testament and the Book of Mormon, as well as artwork and books that place the prophets from Joseph Smith, Mormonism's founder, all the way to the modern prophet as being special witnesses of Jesus Christ, 
who communicate with him directly, giving the church revelation to live by. These men are revered and trusted as being the mind and will of Heavenly Father. In the church's correlated curriculum, including this Gospel Principles Manual, you can see the instruction around prophets. First, Amos 3.7 is quoted, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants the prophets. How fortunate are Latter-day Saints! We thank thee, O God, for a prophet, to guide us in these latter days. We thank thee, O God, for a prophet, to guide us in these latter days. We thank thee for sending the gospel. When a prophet speaks for God, it is as if God were speaking. Doctrine and Covenants 1, 38. A prophet teaches truth and interprets the word of God. He receives revelations and directions from the Lord for our benefit. He may see into the future and foretell coming events so that the world may be warned. But is this how prophets in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints actually function. There is so much psychology that goes into belief. There are functions like the backfire effect. There are psychological mechanisms such as belief persistence. And one of the big ones is confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is the tendency to search for, interpret, and recall information in a way that supports what we already believe. So for believers in a religious system, when you grow up from a young age being taught that your church is the true church, that your church is the one that has real prophets, seers, and revelators, and every lesson, all of your scriptures, all of the words of your leaders and your family and friends confirms this, reiterates it, emphasizes it, one should at least notice how easy it is for the brain to believe those things that they have been taught over and over again and which bring comfort and peace and connect you to the people that you love. Of course, your brain's going to want to believe that. But the question today is whether prophets, seers, and revelators inside the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints actually are what they claim to be. Are you willing to test your comfortable beliefs. Are you willing to find out today whether prophets, seers, and revelators really are trustable vessels of truth? We're going to use one issue today, and then we're going to share a lot of others. But this one will go into a little bit of depth and will help you understand it. And then we'll share with you tons of other issues that are connected or related to whether the prophetic mantle within the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is legitimate. During the life of Brigham Young, second president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and also the second prophet of the church, created church doctrine whereby people of color of African descent could not hold the holy priesthood of the church and could not go to the temple to receive the saving ordinances. The church maintained this doctrine from the middle of the 19th century until 1978, when then-president of the church, Spencer W. Kimball, made a doctrinal change and extended full fellowship to people of color. But if we look at that time period between the middle of the 19th century and 1978, let's look at how the church framed this doctrine. For example, in 1947, there was a correspondence between a Dr. Lowry Nelson and the First Presidency of the Church. Here's what the First Presidency said in that letter. From the days of the Prophet Joseph Smith, even until now, it has been the doctrine of the Church, never questioned by any of the Church leaders, that the Negroes are not entitled to the full blessings of the Gospel. They continued, Intermarriage of the Negro and white races, a concept which has heretofore been most repugnant to most normal-minded people 
from the ancient patriarchs till now. And then they concluded, speaking about interracial marriage, they said it does not have the sanction of the church and is contrary to church doctrine. In 1949, the first presidency of the church, led by president of the church, George Albert Smith, along with his counselors, J. Reuben Clark and David O. McKay, sent out an official letter from the First Presidency. Here's what it said. The attitude of the church with reference to Negroes remains as it has always stood. It is not a matter of declaration of a policy, but of direct commandment from the Lord, on which is founded the doctrine of the church from the days of its organization, the effect that Negroes may become members of the church but that they are not entitled to the priesthood at the present time. The prophets of the Lord have made several statements as to the operation of the principle. President Brigham Young said, quote, Why are so many of the inhabitants of the earth cursed with a skin of blackness? It comes in consequence of their fathers rejecting the power of the holy priesthood and the law of God. They will go down to death, and when all the rest of the children have received their blessings in the holy priesthood, then that curse will be removed from the seed of Cain. Letter from the First Presidency, August 17th, 1949. Such teachings continued with Mark E. Peterson in a public talk at BYU in 1954, where he said, I have read enough to give you an idea of what the Negro is after. He is not just seeking the opportunity of sitting down in a cafe where white people eat. It isn't that he just desires to go to the same theaters as the white people. It appears that the Negro seeks absorption with the white race. He will not be satisfied until he achieves it by intermarriage. That is his objective, and we must face it. We must not allow our feelings to carry us away, nor must we feel so sorry for Negroes that we will open our arms and embrace them with everything we have. Marky e. Peterson was a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, also considered a prophet, seer, and revelator. On another occasion, Marky e. Peterson said, I think the Lord segregated the Negro, and who is man to change that segregation? It reminds me of the scripture on marriage, what God had joined together, let no man put asunder. Only here we have the reverse of the thing, what God hath separated, let not man bring together again. Bruce R. McConkie Another apostle in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, also considered a prophet, seer, and revelator, said Negroes are not equal with other races, where the receipt of certain spiritual blessings are concerned. Mark E. Peterson also said, quote, If that Negro is faithful all his days, he can and will enter the celestial kingdom. He will go there as a servant, but he will get a celestial resurrection. Not only did racist teachings like these get perpetuated all throughout from the 1850s to the 1960s and 70s, but the church defended this doctrine over and over again. It claimed that this was from God, that this ban on the priesthood and this ban on temple ordinances against those of color, those of African descent, was straight from Heavenly Father as a revelation and commandment. And not only that, but it was also the doctrine of the church that people of color were prohibited from the priesthood and going to the temple because they were less valiant in the pre-earth life and that they carried with them a curse from Cain, Abel's brother. In 1978, Spencer W. Kemble removed these restrictions, but the church never acknowledged that its past leaders were wrong until 2013, when it released its Race in the Priesthood Gospel Topic essay. In one of the ending paragraphs, the church says, quote, Today, the church disavows the theories advanced in the past that black skin is a sign of divine disfavor or curse, or that it reflects actions in the pre-mortal life, that mixed-race marriages are a sin, or that blacks or people of any other race or ethnicity are inferior in any way to anyone else. Church leaders today unequivocally condemn all racism, past and present, in any form. But for believers, 
have you thought out the repercussions of such a doctrine that was pervasive throughout your history and then an abrupt reversal of those restrictions with a future disavowal of those past doctrines as disavowed racist theories. Think about this. You have prophets, seers, and revelators from Brigham Young all the way to Spencer W. Kimball who believe they know from God that there are doctrines in the church that people of color were less valiant in the pre-mortal earth life and that they carried with them a curse from Cain. Your prophets, seers, and revelators, now by the church's own admission, were mistaken. Mistaken about what they thought was doctrine. Mistaken about what they thought was revelation. Mistaken about what they felt by the Holy Ghost was true. But not only was it multiple prophets, one after the other in a line of succession, who were wrong, it was also their counselors in the First Presidency and the remaining apostles in the Quorum of the Twelve who also were mistaken. You're talking about 120 years, 130 years of prophets, seers, and revelators being completely wrong on something that forbid people of color from having access to the priesthood and to the saving ordinances of the gospel. Notice that the church today calls those things disavowed theories, but that the quotes from the past, from Brigham Young all the way to David O. McKay, refer to those teachings as doctrine. How could prophets, seers, and revelators be wrong about doctrine? And if they're wrong about something as serious as prohibiting a segment of God's children from having access to the priesthood in the saving ordinances, what else could they be wrong about? Is this an isolated issue? Is this just one issue they were blind to? Or is there a pattern of LDS prophets being inaccurate and inefficient? Here are doctrines and beliefs that have changed in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Latter-day Saints were previously taught that exaltation has you being like God and overseeing your own planet. This teaching is now refuted by the Church. Latter-day Saints were previously taught that the Garden of Eden was in Missouri. This teaching is now in question by the Church itself. Latter-day Saints were previously taught that oral sex is sin. The Church only months later instructed its leaders to refrain from teaching such. Latter-day Saints were previously taught that the restoration was completed or mostly completed. The church now teaches that we are only in the beginning of an ongoing restoration. Latter-day Saints were previously taught that birth control was a sin and prohibited. This teaching is now diminished by the church. Latter-day Saints were previously taught that homosexuality was unnatural and a choice and could be cured. The church now acknowledges that homosexuality is not a choice and that humans are born with this attraction, and that such cannot be cured. The church only says now that the actual act of two people of the same gender being intimate cannot occur for one to be in full fellowship with the church. But they acknowledge that the attraction itself is not a choice, and that such cannot be cured. Latter-day Saints were previously taught that tithing was to be paid on surplus or interest. The church changed the definition to 10% of gross income. Latter-day Saints were previously taught that evolution was a heresy. The church has waffled on this teaching, seeming to advocate multiple positions. Latter-day Saints have been taught that the flood in the days of Noah was a global flood. Today, LDS apologists and scholars acknowledge that this doesn't mesh with science, and many advocate a local flood. Latter-day Saints were previously taught that people of color were cursed and less valiant while a succession of prophets testified of these doctrines. The church today disavows these past doctrines as racist theories. Latter-day Saints were previously taught that suicide was a sin. The church today refutes this position. Latter-day Saints were previously taught that Jesus was married and that God and Mary had sex producing her pregnancy of the Christ child. This teaching has been abandoned by the church. Latter-day Saints were previously taught that Adam was God and that Elohim was heavenly grandfather. The church today disavows these past teachings as heresy. Latter-day Saints were previously taught that the Roman Catholic Church was the whore spoken of in Revelation and the great and abominable church. This teaching has been abandoned. Latter-day Saints were previously taught that people with disabilities 
were less valiant in the pre-mortal life. The church has reversed this position and now teaches that they were the most valiant of spirits. Latter-day Saints were previously taught that Cain was Bigfoot. This teaching has been abandoned. Latter-day Saints were previously taught that Lamanites were the principal ancestors of the Native Americans. They have rescinded that claim and now pronounce that the Lamanites are among the ancestors of the Native Americans. Latter-day Saints were previously taught that the Book of Mormon was absolutely and completely an ancient text. Today, the church's scholars and apologists admit it contains significant 19th century material. Latter-day Saints were previously taught that the papyri from which the Book of Abraham was translated were in fact the writings of Abraham written by his own hand. This teaching has been rescinded. Latter-day Saints were previously taught that the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible is a restoration of the original text of the Bible, which had been corrupted over time. The church today acknowledges that the Bible translation plagiarized from Adam Clark's commentary, a contemporary source to Joseph Smith. Latter-day Saints were previously taught that the Book of Mormon was translated by the means of the Nephite spectacles, used with the plates directly. Today, the church acknowledges that it was instead a stone in the hat that Smith used for treasure digging, where he placed the stone in the hat with the alleged plates either covered or out of sight completely. Latter-day Saints were previously taught that Joseph Smith was an honest man and a man of integrity. The church today, along with LDS scholars and apologists, acknowledged that Smith lied repeatedly about polygamy and that he highly pressured young girls into intimate relationships. Latter-day Saints were previously taught that the devil has power over the water. This teaching has been seemingly abandoned. Latter-day Saints were previously taught that Joseph Smith only dabbled in treasure digging and gave it up quickly. Scholarship today imposes that his treasure digging activities were widespread and pervasive. Latter-day Saints were previously taught that Brigham Young transfigured into Joseph Smith. Modern scholarship shows that the first to tell this story were not even present for the event. Latter-day Saints were previously taught that the 1838 and Wentworth version of the first vision was the only account we knew about, and Joseph's telling about that vision was consistent. We learned later that there were two other accounts of the first vision stored away in the church history department, and at least one of them was intentionally removed by church historian and later LDS prophet Joseph Fielding Smith when he cut the 1832 account out of Joseph Smith's journal with a penknife and stored it away in the church historian's vault. And to note that these two accounts that came forward at a later date contradict significant parts of the 1838 account, including whether Joseph Smith saw only Jesus or whether he saw both God and his son. Latter-day Saints were previously taught that the temple endowment was a restoration of an ancient ceremony that Masons happened to have a corrupted form of. The church has abandoned this teaching. Latter-day Saints were previously taught that the saving ordinances, as originally delivered to Joseph Smith, can't be altered. They have been altered repeatedly. Latter-day Saints were previously taught that you can lose your virtue in the act of being raped, still a scripture and teaching in the Book of Mormon. The modern church has distanced itself from this teaching. Latter-day Saints were previously taught that garments have supernatural protective power. This teaching has been abandoned. Latter-day Saints were previously taught that polygamy ended with the 1890 Manifesto. The church today acknowledges that such wasn't true and that polygamous marriages continued being sanctioned by the church even after the 1904 Second Manifesto. Latter-day Saints were previously taught that as man is, God once was, and as God is, man may become. Prophet Gordon B. Hinckley refuted half of this couplet on national television in the 1990. Latter-day Saints were previously taught that Native American skin changes from dark to white as they align with the gospel. The church has abandoned this teaching. Latter-day Saints were previously taught that polygamy is an essential doctrine that can't go away with the gospel. This teaching has been abandoned by the church. Latter-day Saints were previously taught that the civil rights movement was a communist plot. This teaching has been abandoned. Latter-day Saints were previously taught that the November 15 policy was a revelation from God, only to have a second revelation three and a half years later, rescinding that original November 15 policy, where leaders claim that both were done by revelation. Latter-day Saints were previously taught that the church operated via a lay ministry. Due to leaks about income to the leaders, the church today acknowledges its leaders are paid a significant income. Latter-day Saints were previously taught that single sisters could not take out their own endowment. This teaching was changed. Latter-day Saints previously covenanted in the temple not to participate 
in things of loud laughter, and that loud laughter was a sin to be avoided. The church has abandoned this teaching. Latter-day Saints were previously taught that women had to pledge obedience to their husband. This teaching has been abandoned. Latter-day Saints were previously taught that you had to live plural marriage to qualify for the highest degree of the celestial kingdom. This teaching has been abandoned. Latter-day Saints were previously taught that one could help another person atone for their sins by committing violence against them. This doctrine was taught by Brigham Young and called blood atonement. This teaching has been abandoned. Latter-day Saints previously taught that the faith to be healed was more significant than not having such faith. Today, the church teaches that faith not to be healed is the greater faith. Latter-day Saints were previously taught that an essential principle of the gospel was free agency. The church has disavowed this teaching and now teaches something different called moral agency. Latter-day Saints were previously taught that the Hill Cumorah from the Book of Mormon is the hill in Palmyra, New York. The church has abandoned that belief and no longer claims to know where the Book of Mormon took place, though they highly insinuate Central America. How could prophets, seers, and revelators be wrong about so much to the point where they abandon or reverse their position? These are the men that we're supposed to trust to talk to God. But this is a bigger problem than simply considering how wrong they have been on practically everything in the gospel. The next question we need to ask is what have modern prophets given you that have been a benefit to you? If you're a believer listening to this, you've been raised from a young age to think that these men have access to God, that they are the ones who are in communication with God, and that by you listening to their words and being obedient, you get to know what God wants for you in your life. To demonstrate this, I'm going to do an exercise. We are going to take Joseph Smith, the founder of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but also the founder of all the other breakoff groups of Mormonism, and set him off to the side. The reason I do that is because founders of any high-demand fundamentalist religion tend to create charismatic theologies and ideas that people find attractive. I'm also going to remove Brigham Young for the same reason, because the early leaders in any given movement often come up with really attractive ideas and create a theology that brings followers in. Consider faiths such as Scientology, Jehovah's Witnesses, Seventh-day Adventists, for example. Those three churches have very dynamic theologies, a very interesting church history, and also see their early leaders as highly inspired. And there are lots of loyal followers to those movements. So we're going to start with John Taylor, third president of the church. And I'm going to go through each one of these and give you a moment. Now, remember, as a believer, you've been taught that these men are prophets, seers, and revelators, and that these are the men who speak directly to God, and that you need to be loyal and obedient to them. But I ask you, starting with John Taylor, what did John Taylor give you? Take a moment, and in the comments of this YouTube video, please list all the incredible things he gave us. How about Wilford Woodruff? And if you say the 1890 Manifesto, again, we would need to point out that that was a effort to appease the U.S. government, to convince the U.S. government that they had in fact stopped practicing polygamy, but in reality, they continued polygamy long past Wilford Woodruff, but they did it secretly underground. How about Lorenzo Snow? How about Joseph F. Smith? Heber J. Grant? George Albert Smith? David O. McKay? Joseph Fielding Smith. This is the president of the church who went as church historian. Not only did he cut out the 1832 account of Joseph Smith's first vision and store it away in the church historian's vault, but this is also the person 
who created the theology that was generally accepted by Latter-day Saints in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s. And it was reiterated by his son-in-law, Bruce R. McConkie, who wrote the book Mormon Doctrine. Almost all of the teachings of these two men have been denounced and abandoned. If we were to make a book about all the things that Joseph Fielding Smith and Bruce R. McConkie taught, which the church today no longer accepts, it would be astonishing to the reader. How about Harold B. Lee? How about Spencer W. Kimball? Again, the most important thing he did was to remove a ban on the priesthood and access to temple ordinances by those of color when the church today acknowledges that they were false theories that have been disavowed. How about Ezra Taft Benson? Howard W. Hunter? Gordon B. Hinckley? Thomas S. Monson? Russell M. Nelson? As you think about each of these men, what is the chance that this church isn't what it claims to be? And the leadership at the top have convinced you through the curriculum and through programming you from the time that you were a young little child that these men had supernatural access to God and that these men spoke directly to him and then conveyed his will to you. What's the chance that that's not true? What's the chance that this is just a high demand? fundamentalist religion that isn't what it claims to be. How would you know? How could you figure it out? If the church wasn't true, what would that look like? And are you able to step back far enough to see Mormonism or the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in the mix with other religions that are similar, such as Scientology or Jehovah's Witnesses or Seventh-day Adventists? When you look at those other faiths, they have a vibrant membership. They also have believers who know the messy issues, but who for which they still believe and participate and are faithful. In the show notes for this episode, I'm also going to include documents that if you want to open your eyes and challenge yourself on whether your faith is true, there will be two other documents that will walk you through the challenges to believing in the church so that you can understand the giant mountain of evidence that runs counter to the church's truth claim. I want to finish with one last segment, and that is to understand the church's theology around what it takes to maintain the gift of the Holy Ghost. Joseph B. Worthland said, from time to time, we hear stories of greed and selfishness that strike us with great sorrow. We hear of fraud, defaulting on loan commitments, financial deceptions, and bankruptcies. We hear of fathers who financially neglect their own families. We say to men and women everywhere, if you bring your children into the world, it is your solemn obligation to do all within your power to provide for them. No man is fit to be called a man who gathers around himself cars, boats, and possessions while neglecting the sacred financial obligations he has with his own wife and children. We are a people of integrity. We believe in honoring our debts and being honest in our dealings with our fellow men. Dallin H. Oaks said, Quote, the white-collar cousin of stealing is fraud, which gets its gain by lying about an essential fact in a transaction, scheming promoters with glib tongues and ingratiating manners, deceive their neighbors into investments the promoters know to be more speculative than they dare to reveal. Difficulties of proof make fraud a hard crime to enforce, but the inadequacies of the laws of man provide no license for transgression under the laws of God. Though their method of thievery may be immune from correction in this life, sophisticated thieves in white shirts and ties will ultimately be seen and punished for what they are. He who presides over that eternal tribunal knows our secret acts, and he is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Joseph B. Worthland said, Having received the Spirit of Christ to know good from evil, we should always choose the good. We need not be misled. 
even though fraud, deception, deceit, and duplicity often seem to be acceptable in our world. Lying, stealing, and cheating are commonplace. Integrity, a firm adherence to the highest moral and ethical standards, is essential to the life of a true Latter-day Saint. He also said integrity means always doing what is right and good, regardless of the immediate consequences. It means being righteous from the very depth of our soul, not only in our actions, but more importantly, in our thoughts and in our hearts. A little lying, a little cheating, or taking a little unfair advantage are not acceptable to the Lord. The consummate reward of integrity is the constant companionship of the Holy Ghost, who will guide us in all we do. Gordon B. Hinckley said, The money the church receives from faithful members is consecrated. It is the Lord's purse. The funds for which we are responsible involve a sacred trust to be handled with absolute honesty and integrity and with great prudence as the dedicated consecrations of the people. We feel a tremendous responsibility, he said, to you who make these contributions. We feel an even greater responsibility to the Lord whose money this is. Take those quotes in juxtaposition with the recent SEC report where top church leaders devised a plan that had deception at every turn with the money it had invested in the stock market in order to obscure the $38 billion it had from being in view of its membership and the general public. I share with you here the nine-page report. On the left-hand side of the screen is page one, on the right-hand side, page two. And as we continue then, page three and four, five and six, seven and eight, and nine. Look at the red underlined sections, and I'll leave each document on the screen for a moment, but by all means, please push pause and read. The SEC and the church both agreed to the language of this report. The church had to sign off on this language. So while their public statement about this incident doesn't tell the full story, one ought to know that the church agreed to the language of this document and what is contained therein is quite telling. On this page, because the left-hand side begins to indicate the degree of deception by which the church carried out this investment strategy, again, in order to, to hide its billions and billions of dollars from its members and from the general public. I also note here on the right-hand side is the pertinent pages of the Church Handbook of Instruction which impose that if somebody carries out a financial deception of this sort, it is mandatory and requires church discipline. Remember, this is your first presidency from Gordon B. Hinckley, James E. Faust, Thomas S. Monson, Henry B. Eyring, Dieter F. Uchtdorf, Dallin H. Oaks, and Russell M. Nelson. Again, feel free to pause the screen and read the red underline section. What you begin to notice when you read through this document is that the church was continually warned by its legal representation of what the fallout might be from this, but that church leaders at every turn continued to approve deceptive practices in order to obscure the money that it had in its possession. And in the final pages, it simply lays out the penalty, which was $4 million fine to the church's investment arm, Enzyme Peak Advisors and a $1 million fine to the church itself. Because filling out this 13F form is required, and the church didn't do that. So the penalty isn't actually that large for the violation that they did, but the violation that members have to deal with is the integrity of the leadership who has no problem being this dishonest and this deceptive behind the scenes in order to carry out fraudulent behavior, creating sh dummy shell companies that didn't really exist and setting up account managers simply based on the fact that they had common names and had little social media presence. When you read the red underlined sections, it becomes crystal clear that the church leaders at the very top of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints had compromised their integrity in order to build up the church's wealth. Again, I put on the screen the pertinent section from the church handbook, which imposes that mandatory discipline is needed in order for these church leaders to repent. So now, recognizing as we went through from the very beginning that we showed you not only 
have prophets, seers, and revelators not been very accurate guides for truth? But also when we look at each prophet in his life, we struggle to find anything of significance that they've done that would allow us to compare them to Moses, Noah, and Abraham. On top of that, we went through their integrity, their honesty, and we showed that that had deep holes in it. If top church leaders carried out financial fraud, how could they have had the gift of the Holy Ghost during their leadership? Wouldn't the Holy Ghost, according to their own theology and their own quotes that we shared in this presentation, condemn them? Doesn't their own theology and quotes impose that these men at the very top of the church couldn't have had the companionship of the Holy Ghost? And if they didn't have the companionship of the Holy Ghost, how did they lead the church via revelation? Is somebody going to make the argument that they weren't worthy of the Holy Ghost, but somehow they still maintained connection to Jesus Christ? So at the end of the day, as a believer, in spite of the fact that you've grown up in this church and been raised from a young age to believe, the question is, what if it isn't true? What if the church is not what it claims to be? 